and welcome to the Perfect Faith Podcast. I'm Kirk Klingerman, your host. This is episode 7 of season 5, and this one's entitled The Basics, Part 1. And we're going to dive right into it right away. So, first things first, why are we going into the basics? Simple. As disciples of Jesus Christ, if we're going to weather any storm that comes our way, we're going to have to have a firm foundation. Without that foundation, there's going to be no stability for what lies ahead, right? We need to, we need to grow deep roots, and it requires the basics to do just that. You know, some might be surprised what the Bible considers elementary teachings. And, with, or, and you know, without those fundamental principles, it's going to be hard to get into the weightier things of the Word. Some things people consider to be the deep things or deep teachings actually fall under the category of, element, uh, of what is considered uh, elementary. It's elementary, you know, and as we get into this, we'll see that shortly. In Hebrews 5, verses 12 through 14, it says this. It says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God or utterances of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Do I have your permission to be blunt? Because I'm going to be a little bit blunt, and I mean it in love. There are some Christians that have been saved for a very long time, but they still fall under the novice category, if you will. They have not grown for whatever reason, whether it's a lack of discipleship or willingness or what have you, but they just simply have not grown. Many of them still need to be taught the Word of God, and we all do, just to be clear. Every one of us still need teaching, but they ought to be in a place by now where they can actually teach the Word of God to other people, besides receiving from others as well. And they're not there. And to be quite honest, a lot of us need to get caught up. We're not where we're supposed to be or should be. And again, I'm not being self-righteous when I say that. I'm not being critical. In fact, as for myself, I find myself constantly thinking, man, I should be further along in my walk with the Lord than I am right now. I mean, there's just this part of me that just refuses to get complacent. And I know what it is to feel complacent at times. There are those times you don't want to do the work, if you will. And I'm not talking about a works-related walk in Christ. In fact, there really is no such thing. You know, we're supposed to rest in the relationship with Jesus, doing everything by faith. You know, it's just like the word says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you are saved through faith, and not that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the point is, isn't about works per se, but it, but we can talk about whether or not we're complacent, right? Truth right now is a prerequisite for the time in which we find ourselves. The time in which we live right now is critical that we get a hold of the truth and not let go of it. You know, regardless of whether we like what the Word of God says, truth is truth. And if we decide to reject it so we can live in our own happy little world, we are going to be sadly disappointed in the future. There is a time coming when we all have to stand before Jesus at the, at the um, judgment seat of Christ. We all are going to have to give an account for our lives, for what we've done, for what we've said, and so on. You know, again, I'm not talking about the great white throne judgment, which is for something else, which that will cover later on at another time. It's just important that we begin to walk a little bit more circumspectly, as the word says, or a little bit more carefully, be more diligent. We need the truth, and we can't make up our own truth. That leads to self-deception. We can't go around thinking this is what the word says, when the reality is the word says something different. There are some that have this mindset of, don't confuse me with the facts, I've made up my mind. 
meaning they're not interested in the truth. They're only interested in living a life that they want to have. But ultimately, they are short-sighted. They're only looking at this present time, which is very temporary. You know, our life is but a vapor. Our time on this planet is very short, right? And some of you that have gotten older know this more than some of the younger people, but time is flying by, and there is coming a time when Earth as we know it will no longer be here. Our life, you know, none of us know our final day, so this is really not a time to get complacent. Again, we got some things coming down the pike. For example, the word says, I will shake that which can be shaken, so that which cannot be shaken will stand. Well, we've been experiencing a lot of shaking in the body of Christ, and there's more to come. And if we're going to stand firm during those times of shaking, we've got to stand firm in the Word. So there are some that need to reevaluate where they're at. I mean, let's get honest. I think I just said this. But it's time that we all get caught up to where we should be, for lack of better words. You know, you know and I know, I think for the most part, whether we should be further in our walk or not, or, or at least that's the feeling anyway. It's just this, the point is, let's not get complacent. This is the time to get a hold of the word and walk the word out the way God intended. And that's, and that's the chief aim, by the way, in these podcasts, as we get into the word, as we're chasing after the word in the way that the Lord intended for us to know the word. You go. And so with that being said, I'm not asking anybody to take what I say at face value. I want you to study the word for yourself. And by the way, if you see something or hear something that I say that doesn't seem to square up with the word, please let me know. Feel free to put in the comments or email me at Kurt at perfectfaith.org. You know, because I want to be aware as well. I, I try to stay open to everything you know, just in, in regards to the truth. I study to see if it be true. So even in what I'm presenting to you right now, I've been taking time to study it. And even recently, I had a dear brother, you know, just share something with me that needed, you know, some correction. You know, not that there was necessarily false doctrine, but it was just easy to be misunderstood. So I received that correction. It's important, you know, as iron sharpeneth iron, so it is with believer with believer. We're supposed to be able to encourage each other. Uh, we should be able to um, correct one another in love, right? And we should be able to receive correction. It's important, right? I mean, it's just like I've asked the Lord continuously, you know, to correct me, to send people my way, uh, you know, if I need correction or what have you, if I'm missing it. And he's done that. He sent people my way to bring correction when I've needed it. And I am so grateful for that. So I'm just being transparent with you. I don't feel like I've got it all together, and I don't pretend to. So when I say some of this stuff that I'm saying, you know, I'm looking at the guy in the mirror as well. I mean, that guy is not getting off the hook either, right? So the way I look at it is we're in this together. We need to encourage and exhort one another. You know, that's part of the purpose of us gathering together as the body of Christ is that we are exhorting, encouraging one another, lifting each other up, and so on. But like I said, we got to be willing to receive correction from one another too. At least consider it, right? At least consider it, you know, and so on. So what are the basics then? What are the basics? So we're going to start out with Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 through 3 to start laying out a basic foundation of basic Christianity 101, if you want to call it that. So Hebrews 6, verses 1, 2, and 3, here's what it says. Therefore, leaving the principles, or elementary teachings, of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, or maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, plural by the way, and of the laying of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. Okay, so there's six things listed here in these verses. Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, the laying of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. 
and we're going to drill down on each one of them. We're not just going to skim over these. I mean, we'll take as much time as required to get a good understanding of each one. And obviously, when you consider the subjects that are listed, there's some of them that's going to require some time and some diligence. And I'm going to you know, do my best to be submissive to Holy Spirit, to try to go the direction that He wants me to go. I'm going to do my due diligence in the study. And so again, I encourage you to study this out for yourself. Share with me, share with all of us, you know, what you find. You know, let's grow together. Let's, let's learn this thing together, shall we? So let's start with basic number one, and that is repentance from dead works. Repentance from dead works. And we're going to break this up just a little bit and start out with the word repentance. We'll begin there. And I will say this. I'm going to, there's going to be an emphasis on repentance. And I really feel that from Holy Spirit. I feel like we need to underscore it. And when we, by the time we get to the last few, what is considered the basic elements of the doctrine of Christ, you'll see why. Especially when you're talking about the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. You see why repentance is so crucial. So that being said, we'll start out in the New Testament definition of repentance. And there's a number of words that are rendered repentance or to repent. So we're going to address three of them today and probably dive into a few more of them next time we meet. And then again, in the process of all it, try to bring all things together, you know, let them all coalesce as one, if, if you will. So the first one, again, this is New Testament, and the New Testament language is Greek, is metanoia. And for those that have a Strong's Concordance, that's number 3341. And it means afterthought, or hence a change of mind. And of course, the mind is where the, uh, the faculty of moral reflection is located, right? This change of mind is meant to be positive, you know, going from evil to good. This word is derived from another word which involves regret. So having said that, so this word does not merely mean, you know, like agony of the mind or regret in of itself. This is deeper than that, and as we get into the verb counterpart, we'll discover that, So, which is to repent. Okay, so this last word I gave you is the noun form. This next one is the verb form, to repent. This is, uh, I don't know if I can pronounce this, but we'll give it a go, metaneo, which is Strong's 3340, which means to perceive afterwards. Hence, to change one's mind and purpose or to think differently. Again, this change is always meant to be for the better. It denotes change of moral thought and contemplation. It involves regret and sorrow accompanied by a true change toward God. It does, it does include that abhorrence or hatred of our, of our sin or our past sin. There is a hatred attached to it. We kind of get the sense of these two words together in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. That's important to get a hold of, right? Godly sorrow will lead us to true repentance, but the worldly sorrow does not. You know, there are those people that basically say, I'm sorry I got busted. But as far as what they did, they don't really care about whether they change or not, right? And obviously that leads to death. Okay, so let's jump into the Old Testament a little bit. We're going to get into one of the words, again, in the Old Testament. Uh, as I said before, there are different words for the word repent or repentance. So this is just one that we're going to cover for this episode. Um and I will say this, this particular word carries just a little bit different meaning than the Greek word that we just shared. This one is uh, shub, which is strong 7725, if you want to look that up for yourself. It's a primary verb, and that means to turn back or hence turn away. It can, but does not necessarily mean to return to the starting point. The basic idea of this word is turning back. It's retract, retracing one step 
in order to turn into the right way or turn to the right way. You know, there's numerous renderings of this word, and of course, just you, as you probably heard me say in the way I've been defining it, one of the renderings is turn, right? As found in Second Chronicles 7, verse 14, which says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now, actually, we actually did an episode on this particular verse back uh, a few episodes ago. So if you didn't catch that one, maybe uh, check it out when you have time or when you have opportunity. The one thing about this particular word, repentance, or to repent, has a lot of emphasis on a national repentance, if you will. If my people who are called by my name, right? And usually it referred to Israel in most cases, right? So whereas the New Testament, the primary thing is the individual. There's a, a, an emphasis on the individual where this word has a greater emphasis on a nation. But to be clear, it does have the individual application. And in fact, we'll just to give that example, let's jump into Ezekiel chapter 33. Uh, we're going to read 11 through 16, but if you want a, a fuller context of it, read verses 1 through 20. So Ezekiel 33 verses 11 through 16. Say unto them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And let me stop right there before I go any farther. Did you read that? God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And in other words, he doesn't want to see anyone destroyed. Hence, he sends the word of God to us. He sends us his word, the truth, to keep us from that destruction. Okay, moving along. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn you, turn you from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? See, there's that collective uh, repentance. But yet now we see it going down into the individual. Therefore, you son of man, say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day he turns from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live, in, live for his righteousness in the day that he sins. Let me stop there. This kind of says we can't rest on our laurels, right? I mean, this is really hard stuff. Some, some have thought that what they've done in the past makes up for their present. In other words, I've done all these righteous acts, as it were, right? Quote, end quote. Thinking that that's going to make up for any sin that I commit today. But the, the Lord is saying, no, you can't trust in what once took place. And of course, us as disciples of Jesus Christ, our righteousness is found in Jesus only because he is our righteousness, which you'll find that in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust, listen to this, if he trust in his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses <laughs> shall not be remembered. But for his inequity that he has committed, he shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, you shall surely die. If he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins that he has committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. There's a whole lot in there that we could unpack. But let me say this. You know, sometimes people say when we say things like, hey, if you don't repent, you know, you're going to be destroyed. Or you may find yourself in hell or the lake of fire. That sounds like we are being really harsh, right? Or unloving. But the truth is, we're being very loving. I mean, how can we celebrate anyone living contrary to the Word of God, knowing the end state of that life? 
You know, it's like I said before, we all are going to face Jesus in the end and give an account for our life. And if we are not found in right standing in Jesus, then we would find ourselves in the lake of fire, ultimately, eternal judgment. Again, that's for, we'll get into that deeper when that time comes. But I'm just saying, it is actually very loving to give a warning. But let me say this, the way in which we give the, the warning to someone makes a difference. I mean, if we get all self-righteous and get in someone's grill, more than likely they're not going to receive anything from us. Everything that we say has to be done in love. And in order for it to be truth, it has to be attached to love, right? Attached from love, there's no truth. It's just self-righteousness, right? And we got to be careful because we are to bring correction, if you will, with a spirit of meekness, right? We need to be humble so that we don't create a stumbling block which will push someone further away from God instead of drawing them to God. I mean, ultimately, it's up to Holy Spirit because Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us of our sin, of righteousness, and the wrath to come. I mean, we are not Holy Spirit. We cannot make people change their way of thinking. All we can do is speak the truth and love, pray for them, and prayerfully Holy Spirit will move through them that leads them to a place of repentance. But speaking the truth is not hate speech. In fact, to me, it seems if we encourage people to go farther down the path of destruction, that is hatred. Just saying, right? Okay, so what about the Latin side of the house? We don't talk much about that, but there is a Latin word for repentance, and it's, uh, let's see if I can get this right, recipisco, all right. For you Latin teachers, don't nail me on that one. But it means to recover one's senses or come to a right understanding. So to repent then means to reform or to have a genuine change of heart. Repentance, listen to this, repentance goes beyond forsaking sin. One of the reasons that people have difficulty forsaking sin is that their view toward sin hasn't changed. I mean, the way you think greatly influences your behavior. So repentance isn't just merely behavior modification. It, repentance is that change of the way we look at things and what we purpose in our hearts do. So to be clear, I mean, the behavior changes as the result of repentance, but if you have not truly repented, you might find yourself struggling with those things that we should not do. And then you get yourself caught into this law mindset instead of a faith mindset, which, you know, the, the law mindset says this, I will not do this, just as the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, right? Faith says... God is, and he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. Faith says, I can do all things through Christ. So if I follow Jesus and walk by faith, I will fulfill the law that has been given. You know, for, So in other words, if I love people well, because that is our commandments, love God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If we are busy loving people, we won't worry about transgression against them. But if our mindset isn't right you know, on how we view sin, I mean, in the truest sense of the, of the word, we're going to find ourselves struggling a whole lot more than if we decide to make a change in the way we think about stuff, right? You know, just because someone stops doing something doesn't mean the desire has gone away. You know, let's be honest. We've all experienced that. You know, there are things that we wanted to do but we just by sheer willpower withstrained ourselves. But then as we, now listen to this. The word says, if we submit to Holy Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That you find in Galatians 5, I think around 14 or so. I don't know. I, I didn't look it up. I didn't plan on it, but it's in Galatians anyway. So if you submit to Holy Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So... Part of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So as we submit to Holy Spirit, a lot of these desires go away because we, like I said, are submitted to Holy Spirit. We're walking in love. We're doing things because we love the Lord. 
But if we're trying to do things or stop from doing things just simply because we know we're not supposed to, we're going to start doing what we would call white knuckle Christianity. And there's no real victory in that because we haven't stepped into faith to receive the victory that Jesus has already given us. In Acts 3 verse 19, it says, Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Again, repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now the word convert means to turn oneself about or turn back. In one sense, it means to turn to God in order to worship him or, or turn in order to worship the true God. We find this in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9 and 10. For they, this, they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had onto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So now you're getting a, a flavor of what repentance means. Just as Jesus sent Paul to the Gentiles to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith, which is Acts chapter 26, verse 18. So there you have it. That's the definition of repentance and to repent, at least these few words that I shared with you. So the question is next then is what is dead works? Because the other half of it was, or the, the verse said, repentance from dead works. So what are dead works? In short, they are religious acts, not born of the spirit and faith. They are sinful, they are carnal, and they bear no fruit. It's often refers, often this this dead works thing refers to external rituals, if you will. You know, it's all for eye service, but there's no real life in it because there's no faith. It's just like, since they're not born of faith, they cannot please God. And we get that from Hebrews 11, verse 6, where it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, part of repentance is simply doing things God's way, which includes forsaking the old carnal nature. Dead works are based on unbelief, in which there is no peace. Now, for some, the motivation for doing things is an unhealthy fear. You know, an unhealthy, you know, that, that fear out of an unhealthy sense, where they're just afraid of condemnation. They haven't really received the peace that comes through true repentance. They haven't received Jesus or they haven't understand what Jesus has done for them and so they're still fearful that they're doing the wrong thing. That's unhealthy. The fear of the Lord, a very good thing. It's the beginning of knowledge and wisdom we know from Proverbs. But true repentance, true repentance brings people to a place of rest where they no longer feel or are no longer self-reliant if if you will, or they're not walking in self-righteousness anymore for that matter. Anything, let's put it this way, anything outside of Jesus would constitute dead works. Anything outside of Jesus is dead works. Hebrews 4, verse 9 through 11. There remains therefore a rest to the people of God, to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Anyway, when we walk by faith, we enter into a place of rest, understanding that there's nothing we're going to be able to do that's going to increase our righteousness. Nothing. So anytime we try to add anything to what Jesus has already done, we enter into self-righteousness and we actually start entering into a place of unbelief or doubt, right? So the point is repentance from dead works just simply says, you know what? It is time to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's time to submit to Holy Spirit and let him lead me in my life. 
That's repentance from dead works in a nutshell. So next time we're going to touch more on repentance and dig just a little bit deeper, and then we'll go on to the next one, which is faith toward God. So until that time, be blessed, my friend.